Previously on the Fan of History, Ashurnasipal II, the king of Assyria, rules the Near East. He has beaten everyone and all nations live in fear. Last time there were 10 rather peaceful years when nobody dared oppose Ashurnasipal II. We also talked about Jezebel and uh, the tyrannic rule of Li, king of Su China. The only ruler in the world as powerful as Ashurnasipal. So what happened in the 850s BC? Well, this will be a three-parter. This is part one. There will be the Battle of Kakar in a battle special. And there will be a part two covering the years 853 to 850 BC. My disclaimer is that I'm just a fan of history. I'm not an historian. And I might be wrong about something. I'm happy to be corrected. Uh, please watch the videos, the great civilizations of the world in 900 BC and previous decade reports from the 9th century BC. So in 860 BC, uh, Osir Khan II, the pharaoh of Upper Egypt, of Lower Egypt, of Northern Egypt, reunifies Egypt, ruling from the north. He is of the 22nd dynasty, and he manages to place his son Nimlot C as the high priest of Amun in Thebes. Uh, the situation in Egypt is very confusing during most of the 22nd dynasty. Uh, uh, but not in this decade. And during this brief respite from chaos, Osir Khan II has the time to look into foreign politics. And what he sees really worries him, because the Assyrians are getting very strong, and eventually even Egypt might be threatened by the might of the Assyrians. So in 859 BC, Ashurnasipal finally dies. He ruled Assyria from 883 to 859 BC. Uh, I think he dies peacefully. His death is not recorded. We don't know how he was buried. Uh, we don't know what the ceremonies were. There are burials later of Assyrian kings. We know a little more about. He has chosen his successor, his son, Shalmaneser III. I um, really liked talking about Ashurnasipal II and I can't really let him go yet. So I have made a tribute video to him with some music, a music video pretty much. And I might do another article about him or another uh, video about him. He was a strong king that built an empire and he exacted heavy tribute from his uh, conquests and he had many, many haters. So how do you take over after a father as strong as Ashurnasipal II. Everyone was angry for his massacres, for his heavy tribute. The vassals were waiting for him to die. And I like to speak about my own grandfather actually. He wasn't Ashurnasipal, but he was a very hard businessman. And he had success in business by being hard. He wasn't ruthless, but he, he was there to earn money and he didn't care if he made people angry at him. And he died quite suddenly when my father was 21 years old and inherited all the business. And luckily for my father, he had uh, studied economics and uh, did a pretty decent job of taking over all the businesses of my grandfather. But it made me think of this situation. Look at the demands placed on Shalmaneser III. So everyone is hating Assyria. So what? What does it take to succeed to such a position? So here, meet Shalmaneser III. His name means the god Shulmano is preeminent. And Shulmano is a weird god, uh, an Akkadian god probably, worshipped in Assyria. He's the god of the underworld, a god of fertility, and a god of war. And as all Assyrian gods, he is an aspect of Asher, the god of war, because the Assyrians are monotheists that worship maybe a thousand different gods. Mm, that makes no sense, but that's the situation. But it will turn out that Shalmaneser III is a very ruthless and strong king. And he is not as lucky as his father, and he doesn't really have the success of his father. So I would say he's about 95% of Ashurnasipal II. 
and he will have a hard time we will see if this will be enough because the other countries in the Near East are making alliances and they know that they have to do something about the Syrians because they don't want to see another Ashur Nasirpal. Shalmaneser will have to do 34 campaigns against the enemies of Ashur. And he has a new problem, Urartu, the new nation to the north that Arami founded in the last episode. So what does Shalmaneser do? Well, he gets a best friend to the south. Nabu Apli Idina is the strongest king Babylon has seen in ages. And Babylon has been on good terms with Assyria has been on good terms with Babylon since the cult in Inerta's days. That was Shalmaneser's grandfather. So it is time for Shalmaneser to make a really strong pact. And this is the strongest alliance Assyria will ever have. There is a lot of culture exchange. And Shalmaneser and Nabu Aplidina are like brothers. And there might be a specific point to Nabu Aplidina here and his reasons to make this strong alliance with Assyria, but we'll talk about that later in part two. Uh, Babylonian gods have been worshipped in Assyria for a long time as aspects of Asher, and this increases during the days of Shalmaneser. But now his southern flank is guarded by a strong ally so now Shalmaneser can go to his main plan he can attack everyone and the son of Ashurnasipal goes to war and woe to those who dare oppose Assyria so in 859 BC Shalmaneser III attacks Urartu this new kingdom the kingdom has just been founded and the capital is Sugunia and I think it's this place uh, we actually, these place names from the Assyrian inscriptions are hard to locate often. But it is a city, a town on the shores of the Nairi Sea, which is today's Lake Van in uh, uh, Turkey. The royal army she ravages Kubushkia, which is over here. Uh, they defeat, Shalmaneser defeats Aram in open battle and he retreats to his capital of here. Uh, th this is probably Sigunia. And the capital is sacked, other cities are sacked. Arami manages to escape and flees to the north of the lake. Shalmaneser, an Assyrian king, washes his weapons in the Nairi Sea. That I claim this sea. And the Gilsanu. The guys over here, they immediately pay tribute to Shalmaneser and says, Whoa, we never wanted to fight you. We hate Arami. And Shalmaneser builds a lot of things during his long reign. Uh, one of the things he builds is a palace in a place called Balabat in Assyria. And it has bronze gates. And these bronze gates are filled with inscriptions from uh, Shalmaneser's northern campaigns. So this, these events are depicted. But Arami is not discouraged. He has a new kingdom and he makes a new capital. So he moves the capital up to, up to Arsashkun up here on the other side of the lake. Which will be harder for the Assyrians to reach. He is building his kingdom based on the Assyrian model. They worship Kaldi, the god of war. And they use Assyrian at this point as their language. They have scribes that are have been taught in Assyria because a lot of people from the Nairi lands were involved in building uh, Ashur Nasipal's great city and there are people that learned other skills such as building fortresses stuff from the Assyrians so Urartu is quickly becoming a, a copy of Assyria but it's located in a much easier defensible territory next year uh, Shalmaneser marches towards the Mediterranean. He has quashed the Urartian threat and now he wants to repeat his father's greatest triumph. This is actually within a year from his succession. So he's, he's starting strong. He wants to prove that Assyria has not grown weaker. But the Neo-Hittite Aramean states of the west of what is today Syrian Turkey, they are fed up with Assyrian domination. Uh, some of them are Kumuku and Gurgum, who has actually never been ravaged by Ashurnasipal. They are up here, called Kumu and Gurgum on this map. They pay tribute. 
But at Samal, which is here at Sin Kirill, uh, Shalmaneser is faced by an alliance, an army of an alliance. And this alliance is made by Samal itself, then guarding its own home territory, Patin, the Bit Adini, the tribe that fought uh, Shalmaneser, uh, Ashnasipal before. Remember, they placed a king in a southern tribe and they have. They reluctantly gave up when Ashurnasipal beat them hard. But also the city of Karkamish, the powerful old Hittite city, is also breaking its bonds with Assyria and joining this alliance. And the key figure in the alliance is uh, Sapalulme, the Patinian, who is from Patin. But Shalmaneser III wins the battle with a powerful royal Assyrian army that his father gave him. And at that point, the Bitagusi to the southeast over here remember that they are supposed to pay tributes. They were, we were never with the alliance. But Shalmanis is not satisfied, so he moves towards Patin. And remember, there is a town there filled with Assyrians that Ashurnasipal placed there. And they join him. And he lays siege to Alisir or Alimush, located in modern Antakya. This is the fortified city of Sapalulme, the Patinian. And there are also three other kingdoms of the area, Q, here, Kilaku, and Yashbuku. Uh, they joined the alliance, so now seven kingdoms are opposing the Assyrians. But Shalmaneser crushes them all and puts a new king, Kulparunda, on the throne of Patin. Meanwhile, in Greece, the island of Euboea is growing stronger. The city of Chalchis, in the middle of the island, uh, and the city of Eritrea were both mentioned in the Iliad as Mycenaean cities in the 13th century BC. And the ships set for the Trojan War in the Iliad, they gather, uh, gathered at Avilis, which is the south bank of the bay north of Chalcis. Uh, the archaeological record does not confirm a city in Eritrea at this time, and I'll talk more about that later. And there is a small town called Lefkandi, located on a plain between the sites of Chalcis and Eritrea, that will later become important. But there are sailors going out on the Ionian Sea, talking and trading with the Phoenicians, and trading with the rest of Greece at this time. And it seems that Chalcis is the most powerful town in Greece, which does not mean much because we're still in the, in the Dark Age. And I'm only talking about mainland Greece because Miletus, located in southwestern Turkey on the Ionian Greek, in the Ionian Greek area, is uh, probably more powerful at this time. In Babylon, a work called the Era Epic is probably written now during the reign of Nabu Apli Edina. Era is the Babylonian god of mayhem, pestilence and political confusion. We know the writer of this uh, story, that is a uh, part of it is depicted on this thing. The writer is Kapti Ilani Marduk, a descendant of Dabibi, and he claims that the text came to him in dream. We found 36 copies of this text on, in five sites in Old Babylonia, and that is more copies than the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, the Era Epic talks about the political turmoil of the Aramean invasions, and they have been going on for a long time, and it's sort of a religious work, so it talks about why this happened to Babylon, and why it will not happen again, and why times are getting better in Babylon. And it also um, then talks about Babylonian strength growing, which is something we clearly see in this time. In 857 BC, Shalmaneser III does not rest. He goes to campaign every year so far. He wants revenge against the Bit Adini and Karkemish. Uh, the Bit Adini were crushed by Ashurnasipal. Karkemish was always loyal, or at least they always paid a tribute. Uh, so he wants to punish the Bit Adini and Karkemish. And in 857, he goes to war against them. He takes the city of Tilbarsip here. And that is the main city of the Bitadini, which has never fallen to the Assyrians before. He also takes the fortress of Sasabe, 
which uh, was built by Carchemish to protect the city of Carchemish. And everybody play, uh, pays their tributes and promise to pay annual dues to Shalmaneser. So Patinus, Samal, Bitagusi, Carchemish, Kumuku, they all pay tribute. So and Q doesn't, but the resistance in northern Syria, southern Turkey here is is broken. Shalmaneser has won. But the Bitadini, they are not allowed to pay tribute anymore. They have lost their chance. So in 857 BC, Shalmaneser entirely conquers the area of the Bitadini to the east of the Euphrates. And he renames till Barsit Kal Shalmaneser. And Kal Shalmaneser becomes the capital of uh, the province of Bitadini, which becomes a province of the Assyrian Empire. But Akuni, the king or the chief of the Bitadini, he flees and he managed to take away a large portion of the army and he's recruiting soldiers from other tribes to fight the Assyrians. But the other tribes are not that interested. And next year, everyone pays tribute to Shalmaneser III. So in 856, as the Western powers are paying tribute, Shalmaneser has time to punish Arami for still keeping up the Urartu thing in the north. So Shalmaneser, uh, Shalmaneser starts from his new city of Kal Shalmaneser. And it's a west-east sweep, not an east-west sweep. Damn it. Uh, so he moves into the upper Tigris area, which is exactly to the west of this map. It's over here. And he lays waste to the land and site. And he plunders all the way to the north shore of the Nairi Sea, Lake Van. And he lays siege to Arsashkun. And there's a bitter fight between Shalmaneser and Arami. And we have a rare record of Assyrian losses. 3,400 Assyrian soldiers are killed. And several cities are laid waste by Shalmaneser. He moves to Mount uh, Eritia and he washes his weapons in Lake Van. There is a victory stele mounted on Mount Eritrea. Uh, the Gilsano again offers tribute, but Kubushkia that he fought uh, in 859 is ravaged again by Shalmaneser. This was a grand sweep through Urartu, but Arami survives again. He has lost two capitals in three years, but he's still the king of Urartu. The priesthood, of Ish the priesthood of Ishtar, which is important in, uh, uh, in Assyria, it's a Babylonian god again, but they celebrate this great victory by writing a poem. And that is a rare occurrence. So Shalmanes is really proud of his northern war. In 855 BC, Shalmanes' greatest buddy, Nabu Apli Idina, the great king of Babylon dies. He ruled Babylon for 33 years. He was a strong and capable ruler, one of the best Babylon ever had actually. And he even got away with sending men to fight Ashurnasipal, but he was never attacked by Assyria. Nabu Aplidina was responsible for military success and cultural revival. And his reign is very much the end of an old era and the beginning of a new for the ancient city of Babylon and its country, Babylonia. The Aramean invasions are over, and this time is the last time the Kassites hold positions of power in Babylon. And the Kassites have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years in Babylon. But they leave, they have re retained their tribal identity during all this time, and they set themselves up within Babylonia, uh, in the east, and the foothills of the Sagros Mountains, and they become a semi-independent power in Babylonia, which is not a good thing for anyone. In 855 BC, upon the death of the great king, succession is unclear. Uh, the great king said that Marduk Sakishumi should be the king after him, but there are many people that don't want him as the king. So another son claims power, Marduk Bel Usati. And he has strong support. So this might have been the reason why Nabu Aplidina was so keen to have a strong alliance with Shalmaneser. So Shalmaneser III of Assyria is informed that the wrong 
there might be a king he's not allied with who will sit on the throne of Babylonia. Moving far to the east to So China, we have a tyrant. King Lu is becoming King Li is becoming even more and more tyrannical. So uh, people are complaining, but there is a new law in this year. And it says that anyone who speaks against King Li will be killed. And remember, the Zhou dynasty is built on having the mandate of heaven. And heaven can revoke this mandate if they don't behave properly. So China, still in trouble. King Li, still in power, still a tyrant. The king of Bitadini who fled... Uh, he and his army is, are located by um, the uh, Assyrians. They have a camp on the west side of the Euphrates. And uh, Shalmaneser moves to fight uh, Akuni. And for some reason Akuni takes this open battle. And of course he horribly loses to Shalmaneser III and the royal Assyrian army. And he's carried back to Assyria along with his troops and all the booty. So Shalmaneser pretty much has an open road to the Mediterranean and he has defeated everybody standing in the way for his access to the Great Sea. And this worries the most powerful of the Aramean kings, Hadad Eser, also called Hadad Idri by the Assyrians or uh, Ben Hadad. So this guy has many names. But Hadad Eser, the powerful king of Damascus, realizes that uh, he's king of Aram Damascus up here and we just saw Shalmaneser take this entire area north of this map So a Syrian empire here And Hadad Eser is worried that Shalmaneser III will conquer the entire sea coast if not stopped So he is communicating with everybody. He initiates a lot of diplomacy saying we have to fight Shalmaneser III and the Assyrians or we will all fall to their power and the ruler of the Phoenician state of Byblos, located to the northwest on this map, to the very, very north, uh, he talks to Osorkon II in Egypt, because uh, Byblos is the classical friend of Egypt. But Ithobal, the king of Tyre, which is the most powerful city in Phoenicia, he will not get involved in this. He will not fight the Assyrians. And this is something that makes me think that Phoenicia is not united under Tyre yet. Also, King Ahab and his wife Jezebel in Israel receives the message from uh, Hadad Eser. And they are worried about uh, Aramean power from Damascus, but they are even more worried about Shalmaneser. And in 853 BC, their worries become true because now Shalmaneser goes west again. Uh, this is to be the great final attack and Shalmaneser III claims that 120,000 men marches with him in the royal army. And they cross the Euphrates, Kakemish, Mukuku, Bitagusi, Melidia, Samal, Patinu, Gugumu, they all pay tribute and Q doesn't. Q says, oh, we are not in the way, we will not pay tribute to you. The great army marches to Kalman, which is located in Aleppo today. So a new map, this is the location of Aleppo. But the city submits without a fight when they see Shalmaneser's great army. So the royal army continues towards the Orontes river. And on the way, they walk through the kingdom of Hamath, but they encounter no army from Hamath. So they ravage and plunder the cities of Hamath, and Hamath does not submit to Shalmaneser. So, here we are at Karkar on the Orontes river. And when Shalmaneser stands by the river, he sees an enormous army on the other side. Because Hadad Eser have been quite successful in allying all the kings of the area. So 12 nations have united to fight the Assyrians and they're led by Hadad Eser of Damascus. And this will be the greatest battle the world has ever seen. There has been no battle before this with as many soldiers on the field. Or at least it's likely that is the case. There is a battle when the Su China takes when Su China when the Su dynasty takes power in China. That is pretty large as well. 
but uh, this might have been the greatest battle the world has ever seen. And it will be our entire next episode is the Battle of Karkar with Shalmaneser III of Assyria versus the League of Kings. It will be released on the Fan of History YouTube channel on July the 21st of 2014. I do this decade reports weekly. Please discuss the show with me on YouTube or on Facebook. Check out facebook.com Fan of History. You can tweet me and I very much like you to subscribe, like and share because this is what helps me keep going. I'm doing this just for fun, but your feedback makes it more enjoyable. Thank you for watching. <laughs>